oh my gosh. Let me tell you about this guy. He is the absolute dream boat. He cooks. He's, oh my gosh, he's just fantastic with, uh, he's so respectful. He's so, uh, just being around him just makes me feel amazing. Uh, he's a Christian. Him and my dad get along amazing. And he's just, uh, everyone likes him. Everyone adores him. And he's just the absolute best. But, uh, he has kids and I'm only 19 like I don't I don't see myself being a mother what I'm <laughs> not now like that's a that's a huge you know dating someone with kids you know meeting them you're taking on this whole other responsibility but Lot. It's complicated. It's complicated. So I'm starting a series entitled It's Complicated. It's a relationship series, but I don't want to just minimize it to um, just marriage, dating, because there are people in this room who are in, in myriad of situations. You might be in a marriage situation, you might be in a dating situation, you might be in a friendship situation, and we want to cover it all. Uh, also, I, I have a book that I wrote that, that our staff thought would be a great companion to this called Recalibrating Your Relational IQ. They'll have it in the lobby, it's $10. Um, I wrote it probably a year and a half ago. Um, yeah, and also your contributions go to the United Negro College Fund. Uh, four little Negroes, Destiny, Desiree, Devin, and DJ. So, <laughs> so, uh, uh, so it, it's a book dealing with how to categorize relationships. I think a lot of times we cut off good relationships because we just don't know where to place them. And not all relationships need to be removed, they just need to be repositioned. And so if you got, once you get older, you start learning that, you know, you're too old to start just being an island. You just gotta learn how to reposition things. And I, I think that will be very helpful for you and I. Um, Matthew 19, verse 11 through 13, I'm reading it out of the Message Bible so that you can um, see the variation of it. And first Sunday, uh, we're doing communion. I know it's it really, tradition in, in church is really different. I really struggled with, with this idea of wearing jerseys on first Sunday, because communion, I grew up in an old Baptist church. We, we hollowed communion. Like, we didn't care about nothing else but communion. And when, when, when the creative team sends these ideas, I'm like, they're creative, but I don't think they're godly. There's got to be a verse that you got to wear a long robe when you wear communion, when you do communion. And then I saw Pastor Outing come in with a hat in the sanctuary. I just thought to myself, this has gone too far. <laughs> you know, seriously, it is an off-key moment, but you ever think about it? In church, they used to say you can't wear a hat if you're a male. But the women used to wear these big old hats that you couldn't see behind anyway, so I didn't understand. Uh, and we gotta, we gotta, pray for me, I'm a recovering church, church boy. All right, Matthew 19, verse 11 through 13, it says in the Message Bible, but Jesus said, not everyone is mature enough to live a married life. It requires a certain aptitude and grace marriage isn't for everyone some from birth seemingly never give marriage a thought others never get asked or accepted and some decide not to get married for kingdom reasons and if you're wondering what kingdom reasons are it's it's the idea that paul says hey i can give all of my time to just church 
or whatever missions that I feel called to. I don't have to answer to a wife or a husband. I don't have to check in with anybody. If there's a need, I just go. And if that's the type of life that you want to live, then you should be single. And some decide not to get married for kingdom reasons. But if you are capable, I love this part. If you are capable of growing into the largeness of marriage, do it. Now, this morning, my job is to ruffle all of your feathers. Um, because I've sat in church in many marriage or dating or relationship things, and I'm kind of like, I wish you'd go a little bit further. Um, and so that's my attempt. And if any of it bothers you a little bit, I understand. Please don't hesitate to email nate at tkci.org. Um, so let me go through this. <laughs> So let me begin by saying my message title, sermon series, is called It's Complicated. What I want you to put in the chat if you're watching online is the sermon title for this morning. And my sermon title this morning is, It's the Maturity for Me. It's the Maturity for Me. Um, family, interestingly, there was a new selection given online for relationships it was called Married, Single, Dating, and they added another box called Complicated. I don't want to limit this series only to marriage, but to utilize the application amongst all relationships. Each week I'll be signing my old book called Recalibrating Your Relational IQ. My staff thought it would be a good complimentary for this series. I also want to lower the expectation of marriage because in some people's mind, marriage is the fixing to a broken soul. This incredible text puts the message and really drills home the central idea that the commitment of marriage requires a largeness that most ideally want, but practically may not be able to do. They may need to learn how to get better prepared, or they may need to learn how to make adjustments, or they may realize marriage just isn't for me. Let me say this series, we can all learn lessons. It's not, it's not any person in this room, even myself included, who's a subject matter expert on this. I also didn't want to teach a predictable series of content. I do want to challenge some of our ideals for a congruent, relational development that aligns with scripture and not culture. Okay, so there is this constant war that's going on between culture and Christendom. We're always fighting to see what is biblical and what is culture. And if you don't know that culture is important or it's impactful, let me help you see how important and how powerful culture is. If it's Valentine's Day and you don't post something, culture makes you feel like you're not in a happy relationship. Culture says if it's your child's birthday, you need to write a long soliloquy about your child's birthday who can't read it because they're two. In some aspects, we are doing it for the culture. If you're like me, we go anti-culture. If everybody's doing it, I don't want to do it. Everybody's on Clubhouse, I don't want to be on Clubhouse. Number one, God never told me to go to the club, and Clubhouse is too close. So, so th these are things that, th as culture tells us we need to do it, we end up fighting ourselves doing what culture tells us to do. Culture says love is a lease. That marriage is just a contract. But if you have a biblical worldview, you believe that love is not a lease and marriage is not a contract, it's a covenant. So Bible teaches that love is supposed to be eternal, it's supposed to be until death separates us, but culture teaches us differently. For the sake of kids, I'm going to use the word three letters. Culture teaches us the three-letter word is an audition for marriage. 
nate at tkci.org. The three letter word is an audition for marriage. Biblically, it says that it actually consummates a marriage. In God's sight, that's how he knows that you actually are married. Culture, <laughs> culture tells us to bus it. Are you testifying? Culture, culture. <laughs> Don't, let me not see you. No, culture says, culture says, show what you got. Show your body. Yadi, 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 yadi. Culture says, but the scripture says, you, you need to be modest because you don't have to advertise what is good. I lost 15 members already in this pandemic. So these are the challenges that we have with culture. Culture says, let's live together and build first and then get married. Now, scripturally, if you are dating and you live together, there's no sin in living together. Don't throw me out. Hear what I'm finished. Hear the entirety of the sentence. Don't clip it out. Hear the entirety of it. Shacking is not a scriptural word. They didn't shack in the Bible. So you got a little leeway out. There was no shacking in scripture. The way that people came together was, I saw you, you saw my daughter, we're gonna get I'm gonna make y'all get married. And then the way that I'm gonna know that it was real, that y'all didn't violate each other while y'all were enthralled, was there needs to be blood on the sheet. If there wasn't any blood, I'm gonna kill you because you violated my daughter without being married to her. Now in today's culture, if you can live together and not entertain. That's why scripture says, you know what? Don't even try, don't even obtain, don't even entertain the very appearance of evil. So I, I know we live in a culture, the YouTubers are like, there ain't no Bible in that. That's why I don't go to church because they try to control you. No, you, you're absolutely right. There is no scripture that says you can't shack, but you also got to understand in that culture, they didn't date. So Jesus didn't have to address something that wasn't an issue back then. So today's culture, yes, okay, so a lot of us, you know, we, we live together for financial reasons or whatever the case is, and then we're, we're kind of building backwards. The ingredients are different. We're putting a cart before the horse, and then we find out that we have challenges, and then we end up having all these different issues that go on. And I found statistically that just because you had a baby together doesn't mean you should get married together. Because in my old church, that's how we fixed the problem. You came to the church and said, I got pregnant. They said, well, we're going to fix it. You going to go in the pastor's office? Y'all going to get married? Because I'm not going to miss being able to take communion because my daughter and, or my son ended up, and that doesn't fix a marriage. So now here's what we find in this Gospel of Matthew. He says, very interestingly, there were two cultural groups in that day, even in Jesus' day. There was the um, two rabbinic groups that would argue, the Hallels and the Shemels, they would always argue about what is the rule of marriage. They were like the religious gurus of the day. 
And, and, and they begin to say like, well, you can get a divorce if, you know, if your wife don't cook, then you can get a divorce. And then so then people started knocking off their spouses because they just want to find an exit. And then Moses came in the picture and was like, man, in the Old Testament, like God never wanted people to divorce, but because you guys are doing just crazy things to get out of your covenant because it's eternal, let me just let you give a certificate of divorce rather than killing your spouse. Okay, and so they're asking questions to Jesus and Matthew because they really want to know, like, yo, if we, if we want to be believers, like, how do we do this thing the right way? And then Jesus gives them this word that not everyone is mature enough to be married. And some people are not mature enough to be in relationships. Can you realize that some of the relationships that we have lost whether it be friendships, have been because of our immaturity. It wasn't because of them. It was because we weren't mature enough for the relationship. And as you grow older, you learn how to be better. Because some of us graded our parents harshly. And now your children are going to grade you the same. Right? When I, when I first had my first child with my wife, I was 23. I didn't know how to be a father. There was no rule book written. And then being married at 23, like you think you're, you know what you want at 23, but you really don't. So there's a lot of immaturity that happens that you have to mature into. And that's why forgiveness is important because we got to learn how to forgive immaturity. Can you imagine dealing with the 10 year old version of you? You're much, hopefully, you're much wiser now. You know what to fight and what not to fight. You know what to entertain and what not to entertain. That's what maturity does. Let me give you the definition of maturity from, a, from the psychological perspective. Maturity is the ability to respond to environments, being aware of the correct time, location to behave, and knowing when to act according to the circumstances and the c culture and society one lives in. Maturity says, I know when to respond and when not to respond, and I know where to respond and when not to respond. Your kids don't know that because they're immature. How many of your children will go in the grocery store and start screaming, acting crazy, like they ain't got no sense? Because they're immature. You learn maturity as you grow. You know, some couples or some friends, y'all will start having a fight in the middle of the Millennium Mall. Uh-uh, you, we finna settle this right here. And we're like, okay, now y'all can fight, but when you mature, you're like, we're gonna wait till we get home. We're not going to fight at the dinner table in front of our cousins and our family. We're going to wait till we get home because maturity says, I don't need to bring everybody into my situation because when I forgive you, they're not going to forget what you did. That's why, like, as a pastor, like, you know, you start learning maturity. You learn what not to jump into. Pastor, my husband said this about me. Oh, no, he wrong. He this and this and that. He ain't a man of God. And then, yeah, Pastor, he called me this. And I get, and then y'all get back together. And then there's a, well, babe, I'm so sorry. Yeah, you know that pastor over there with a the little Jerry curl. He told me you weren't a man of God. You weren't good. You didn't love God. And all I was doing was just answering what you said. And now y'all back together and he looking at me sideways everywhere. Uh-huh, you told my wife she no good. Because maturity says they going to work it out. And when they work it out, they're going to throw you out. So maturity says, I want to hear both of you at the same time so that you both hear what I said, so that no one misinterprets what I said and takes it for their own value. Maturity is important, and all of us have to learn how to mature. I won't talk about you. I'll talk about myself this entire series so that you don't feel condemned. When I first got married, I was extremely immature extremely it was like hiding cereal so she wouldn't get it <laughs> any more cereal left no i don't know what happened to it i don't know what's going on. wait till they go to bed because immaturity says it's about me even in arguments 
most arguments explode because we're not mature enough to realize what we need to get to is a solution, not who's right. That's, that's what maturity says. But maturity is always tested in relationships. And here's some things I want to give you that I think is going to be very helpful. You don't have a marriage, you build one. You don't, you don't have a marriage, you build one. You don't have a good friendship, you build one. Any friendship you don't build, you're not going to have. If you're not interested to get to know a little bit about me, then you're never going to have a full relationship with me. How many relationships have we had that we didn't build properly? You got to build them. It's, got, it's going to take time to get to know what you like, what you dislike, what you don't like, what you don't want to do, what you want to do. You've got, we have got to build them. You don't have, that's why you go to painting with a twist because why? We need to build a good marriage. We need to build a good dating relationship. Because if all we do, we will not live in a bedroom 24 hours a day. Remember this, after they get your body, they're gonna want your brain. And that's critically important. So here, here's the thing. Two hearts can't come together if two heads are in the way. Two hearts can't come together if two heads are in the way. That works in any relationship. I can't be heart to heart with you as a friend if your head is in the way or if my head is in the way. If you struggle and say it. Don't get mad because I came out here with my Louis Vuitton sneakers and you're behind in rent, now you mad at me. Right, you get what I'm saying? Like, how you gonna come to my house with those shoes and you know I'm struggling? I didn't know you were behind in your rent. You know what keeps relationships from doing well is what we call, let me first back up. So two heads, two hearts can't come together if two heads are in the way. So how many relationships do you and I have that could be resolved if you got your head out the way? I think they meant this by what I said. No, why don't you ask them? Scripture says, don't go to bed angry, Ephesians 4, 26. You know why? Because when you go to bed angry, you start building cases against that person. In 1984, they said this to me. In 1987, they did this. Three weeks ago, they posted it's a beautiful day. Thank God there's no storms out there. Oh, they talking about I'm a storm? <laughs> because, listen to me. Listen to me very carefully. This is very important. When you are offended, you don't hear well. When you're offended, you don't hear well. It's like, no, I, no, Mike... No, you locked me in my bathroom. You designed me a beautiful bathroom and you locked, I went to the restroom and then I was locked in the bathroom. It was some sick cowboy joke that they came up with and he turned the knob from the ins, you know how the knob's on the inside? He put it on the outside. So I go to the restroom, I, I had my phone, and then I, the door shut and I can't get out. I called my sister and I said, hey man, I'm stuck in the bathroom. One of these cowboy guys thought it was a funny joke and they locked me in the bathroom. And uh, my assistant said, you know, one of them people that ask you too many questions, like, why is your door locked? Bro, I don't know, I'm just locked in it. Can you just come open it? How long have you been in there? I, I just called you now, just come open the door. So, but when you're offended, I can, I can go to you and say, hey man, you, I think you locked me in on purpose. But if he thinks I have an issue with him, then any joke you say, he's gonna take personal. I think you got an issue with me because you joked about me. Well, if you've been around me long enough, you know I joke about everybody. 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 Ain't nobody exempt. Everybody. Once I get to know you, it's on and popping. Everybody. But the thing about it is when you're offended, you don't hear well. Everything is personal because you're offended. All right, listen to this. This is the killer. This is the killer. 
This is a mathematical equation that I think we need to all have, and I want to drive this one home. All right, y'all ready? Expectation minus communication equals frustration. Expectation minus communication equals frustration. In every relationship, there's an expectation. If you don't communicate your expectation, you're going to be frustrated. You, you get what I'm saying? If you don't tell me what you need, then you can't expect me to give it to you. Well, I expect you to whine and die. Well, I didn't know that. I expect you to come see me when I'm in the hospital. You do know some people don't want to be seen in the hospital. So everybody has different expectations. You and I got to learn what is your expectation and we need to communicate that expectation because if we don't communicate that expectation, we're going to be frustrated. And some of our frustration is not even necessary if we just told each other what we wanted. Because there is a level of fear for people to communicate what they expect. And if they feel like you're going to shoot them down because of their expectation, they're not going to communicate it. Expectation minus communication leads to frustration. I, I need to know what's important to you. Whether it's a friend, I need to know what, what's your value system. Like, do you, do you believe, what, what's your highest quality? Is loyalty a big quality trait for you? Or, like, do you switch friends? Like, like, like seasons of clothing, like th those expect, like if I know the expectation that, hey, we're only going to be friends for one season and then when, once you make me mad, I'm going to leave you. At least I know the expectation. I won't be disappointed. I'm like, oh, okay, well, you know, it was just, it was cool for a season, whatever. Expectation minus communication leads to frustration. If you don't tell people what you want, you're going to be frustrated because they're not going to give you what you want. Y'all hear that? Expectation minus communication leads to frustration. Like, I mean, you may be in a dead end situation. Like, let them know. Like, listen, we're going to head to divorce. If this doesn't change, this doesn't change. I got biblical grounds. Like, you just can't divorce people for just whatever reason. Like, I'm not here to determine what you do with your marriage, but if you divorce your spouse because you just don't like her hair or his, his breath, like, you just, that's not biblical. Like, now we can get married because culture says, hey, if you don't like it, we'll get divorced and we'll do a divorce party and then we'll divide each other's assets and then we'll dog each other out online and our kids will be separated and then our kids will have a hard time reconciling what love is. Right? And there are some situations where divorce is necessary because you're staying in a situation where you're not really married and you're teaching your children that this is the new marriage. You're, help, you're giving them a hard understanding of what marriage is. Like, mommy, dad, like, you guys sleep in two separate rooms. Is that normal? Like, mom, dad, I never see you all touch each other. Do you do you guys not shower or what's the issue? Because kids are sponges. They're, they're formulating their definition of marriage by how we interact. They're formulating their definition of relationships by how we interact. If you have a BFF and it changes every three months, that's not the BFF's problem, it's you. Like, I know we live in a culture that tells everybody they're the problem. But at some point, I got to look at it and say, if I'm losing all of my relationships, it might be me. If I'm on my fifth marriage, it can't be them. It can't be just everybody don't want to love me. They, they ain't ready for this type of love. No, they, they, they ain't ready. They not ready. Like, we, we've got to grow into the largeness of marriage. And it means growing. To be a good friend, you got to grow into being a friend that people want to be around. 
So let me close with this. So some, some simple you can start doing, even in your marriage or even in your friendships, even in your dating, you need to communicate your expectation. Amen. Like, where do we want to see this end up? Okay, marriage. No, that's not everybody's idea. Some people are like, nah, I, I, shoot, I thought we were just kicking it. I didn't know you were expecting me to propose, you know what I mean? Like, Valentine's Day's coming up. I hope you ain't hoping that I'm going to get on my knees so you can post it online. Because then you're, you're disappointed now. And, and reality says this, y'all. You gotta, if you're single, you got to communicate your expectations on what you desire beyond just marriage. Like, how do, we, how do we manage our money? Are you good with money? Are we willing to take money classes so that we can learn how to both be good at money? Because just because you got a college degree doesn't mean you know how to learn how to use money. Okay, what, what is your expectation when you get mad? Are you going to leave the house and go to your mama house? Or are we just going to sit in this house and figure it out until we... You, you need to communicate your expectation. If I get angry at you, you going to call the police? We need to have these conversations because we don't know. All of a sudden, you come in and you just raise your voice and, and I didn't know that that reminds you of your ex that used to abuse you and now you call 911 and now the police come. They got to take one of us to jail. They take me to jail. Now the relationship is over, not because it wasn't God-ordained, but because you had triggers I knew nothing about. So, it, you know, in the culture that we live in today, you have to do a lot of digging to explore what's real. And even in dating in church, y'all y'all, all this with this brother, this is my brother and sister, please stop, stop, stop it, stop it. That's just my bro, stop it. Just my sis, stop it. I know I'm pulling the player card, but I'm, I need to help some of y'all. If they tell you, don't tell anybody about our relationship yet because I just don't want everybody in the church in my business. That means they got multiple ones in the church. Now, it's not my job to figure out who you're supposed to date. It ain't my job. I ain't that type of pastor where you got to come to me and tell me who you date. But I do find it kind of weird when someone, like, yeah, I don't like people in my business. And then you hear another member say, yeah, I was talking to him. And he said he ain't like nobody in my business, so I kept it a secret. And then another one said, yeah, I was dating him. And y'all all dating him at the same time. He date you on Monday through Wednesday. He date you Thursday through Friday. And then on the weekend. And then on Sunday, make sure we sit on two separate sides of the church. Because I don't want anybody to know. Girl, you getting played. You're going to find out on Valentine's Day when he's talking about I'm busy. But I got to take care of my mama. Your mama been dead two years ago. What you talking about? All right. That's how church brothers, they, they kill. I don't want nobody to know about our relationship because, you know, once church folk get involved, and come on, man, if you've been together six months, somebody need to know. <laughs> Whoop, lost five members right there. Here we go. Let me close with this one. Might need security after service. feel like there's a jump on them spirit coming up. <laughs> Here you go. This is important. I was notorious for this when I was younger. Um, and some of you may still be like that too. Now I'm like this too if you try me. But it take a lot for me to get there. I, I've gotten to a place where I, I went from just blowing up to not responding. So some people go from one extreme to the next extreme. Like if you try me, I just won't say anything. Now if you keep pushing my buttons, I'm one of those that like, bro, he ain't said nothing in a while. That means leave him alone. Because I got all my bullets in my chamber because every time I'm just sitting there. <laughs> Listen, here's, here it is. You should not injure others because the truth injured you. You should not injure others because the truth injured you. 
we got to learn how to manage what we say and how we say it. You should not injure others because the truth injured you. So even in managing, the, the idea is what Jesus says is that we need to grow into the largeness. So we need to grow into being better at it. Being a better leader, being a better friend, being a better father, being a better husband. You know, like you're, you take your kids to the park, you're on your phone. Like I got a message coming in this sermon series called, I'm cheating with my cell phone. Like, you know, we, our kids at the park, instead of being engaged, we're, we're like just scrolling and checking different things that are happening. And we're missing out on moments that are happening because we're so involved with what's happening underneath us as opposed to what's happening what's in front of us. So when I talk about relationships, it's not just, you know, different things. You got to do it with your kids because you, your kids are grading you. And the worst thing to have is your kids grow up and say, I hated my parents. Like they were no good to my development and my growth. Like you, you got you got like different roles and seasons. So relationships is not just that. When you start, when your parents start getting older, you start becoming a caretaker to your parents. That's a different relationship too. Because you find out adults end up turning into becoming kids. Right? And so you got to learn how to, how to balance that relationship. That's important. And you need to, and that's why growth groups are important because you, you develop friendships. I have a friend that I call and I say like, man, how do you manage being a caretaker for your parents? Because it's a lot. And when they call you, it's an emergency every time. Every single time. So you got, you got to learn how, how to do that because you don't want to damage your relationship with your parents because you value them because, you know, they expect you to meet their need right at that moment. And you got to learn how to navigate, navigate around it, right? So that, that's important because everyone's in different stages of life. I'm at the stage where I, I'm almost a caretaker now, and I didn't. I, there was no, there was no introductory course. There was no uh, onboarding. It just happened, and you got to learn how to how to navigate that. My mom will call and say, "Dave, are you busy?" Yeah, mom, I'm working. Okay. Well, let me tell you what I need, right? So, because it's like, it's like, no, you're not, you're not, but you got, you got to learn how to, how to balance that. Because here's the thing that you, that, you, that my friend said that I thought was very profound. He said, yeah, you're a caretaker, but you'll only be a caretaker for so long because when they're gone, you'll wish you did a better job caring as a caretaker. So while it is a heavy season and a different season, you need to learn how to embrace the season and grow into the largeness of it. So it's not a right or wrong. It's not like, man, did you go to church today because the message was for you? No, the message was for me. And how do I mature? How do I mature? Maybe I need to cook more. Maybe I need to order food if I don't cook. Maybe I need to clean the bathroom and be more mature and, and help out in different areas. Maybe I need to iron clothes. Maybe I need to help wash them. There's a scripture verse that says men should not fold clothes. I don't know where it is, but I'm going to find it somewhere. But, but may, may, maybe, you know, you got you to gotta figure out how to be more mature so you can get the most out of what you want. Most relationships would succeed, and I'm done, is if you would invite somebody in before it gets too late. But pride makes us say, I ain't bringing nobody in this because we're going to figure it out on our own. That's why they came to Jesus and said, Jesus, I got a question. We all religious leaders. We all preaching the gospel, the Torah. But we all, all of our people and even us, we're struggling on how does marriage work. And I don't care how successful you are, how much money you have, how many people you know. You have to work on growing into the largeness of a thing. 
And if you're single, again, for the love of God, stop feeling like marriage is the cure to help you become who you're supposed to be. So let us pray and take communion. Father, I thank you for giving enough of what we need through the Word of God to help us grow into the largeness of marriage.